Good morning. Let me give folks a couple seconds here to find your seats. It's a full house, so you may be making some friends. Feel free to find chairs up front here. There's lots of room for everybody, but we're going to have to fill in. So good morning to all of you, and there are a lot of you. Uh, I'm Andy Van Clunen, and I'm CEO of National Skills Coalition based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and on behalf of our partner organization for this event, New America, and all the national organizations and foundations who invested so much time and resource in bringing us all together, I want to welcome all of you to Apprenticeship Forward. So this national gathering was conceived as a way to recognize the work of many of the people in this room today. People have done so much to ramp up the profile and development of apprenticeship in the United States over the past several years. And to help us all begin to chart a way forward so that we can be working together as business leaders, labor leaders, community organizations, community colleges and high schools, workforce boards, state and local policy makers, and national leaders both in Congress and in the Trump administration to continue to build out apprenticeship as a means not only to meet our economy's skilled workforce needs, but to create pathways to a better life for millions of students and workers here in the United States. So why are we all here? What is the source of this growing interest in apprenticeship? Obviously, it's been around for decades, this idea of investing in somebody hiring them while they are still learning, giving them a chance to earn and learn, uh, being able to acquire experience on the job while earning a paycheck, getting new skills in the classroom, and moving towards some kind of industry certification and higher wages. We've had these practices around for years in some of our industries here in the United States. Why the surge of interest now? Well, there's a lot of different explanations. Some of it came out of the concerns about long-term unemployment coming out of the recession and how it is that we could more quickly get people back to work even as they were skilling up for a new job. Concerns about rising college costs and the, and the income returns to students. Industry complaints about not being able to find enough people to fill middle-skilled positions that, they, were, uh, that, they, were, that were, they desperately needed to fill in order to kind of grow their companies. Uh, the influence of foreign-owned companies here in the United States who were bringing some of their apprenticeship lessons that they had developed over years in other parts of the world to bring them here as part of their workforce strategies here in the U.S. All of these are uh, contributing reasons, but a lot of the momentum, a lot of the increased interest in this field is largely because of many of the people in the room today. Folks are developing effective practices, expanding your efforts, uh, developing apprenticeship opportunities in new industries, uh, and these are the kinds of things that we could not have done without the work that you all have done back at home in your communities. And so we want to thank you for taking time away from that work to be joining us all here together in Washington to share what you're doing with each other and to help those of us here in Washington who are trying to figure some of these things out to understand what we can do to make it easier for you to continue to expand your efforts and so that we can bring apprenticeship to a range of industries throughout this country. And the good news is that policymakers are listening. As you know, state, and state governments have been on the front lines of this apprenticeship renaissance. Many of them are represented here today. And the federal government has noticed as well. In fact, through both executive action and bipartisan congressional support, the federal government has invested over $260 million in apprenticeship expansion over the past couple years. And just yesterday, Republicans and Democrats came together in the House to approve an additional $95 million in funding, a $5 million increase in that work for the balance of this year. That just does not happen in Washington, D.C. So we should be very happy about that. We should celebrate that moment and recognize that we are at a momentum point here on behalf of this field. But how are we going to be able to most effectively use those resources? And even more importantly, how are we going to leverage the additional resources from other state and federal programs and from the private sector so that we're not just counting apprentices in this country by the hundreds of thousands, but by the millions? That's the real project before all of us uh, over the next two days. So in just a few moments, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Sarah Steinberg from J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the five philanthropic leaders who originally conceived of this national event. They saw the need for a gathering like this to answer three big questions related to how it is that we're going to take apprenticeship to scale in the United States. And you'll see that we've structured uh, these next two days together around these three themes. 
So question one, how do we engage more industries and a greater number and diversity of companies within those industries, including smaller firms, to help them adopt apprenticeship as a source of their current and future skilled workforces? In just a few moments, we're going to hear both from our opening keynote speaker and from a panel of industry leaders why their industries have begun to look at apprenticeship as a workforce strategy or how they've begun to take a different look of an apprenticeship and changing some of their apprenticeship practices to respond to the changing needs of their industry and a diversifying workforce. And after this morning's plenary, uh, and that's going to be, after this morning's plenary, then you all are going to be breaking into industry discussion groups where you'll have a chance to share with each other the work you're doing on these issues within particular industries, to hear from other uh, experts in the field, and to think about how it is that we could grow apprenticeship opportunities within that sector. Second question, how do we diversify and grow the pipeline of young people and adults who should have the opportunity to become a working apprentice? Uh, this afternoon at lunch, my colleague Mary Alice McCarthy from New America is going to introduce a great set of lunch panels with both apprentices and program officer, uh, operators about how they're effectively helping different groups of people become apprentices and how we're overcoming a range of different barriers that have in historically helped some, uh, stop some of those folks from being able to get into apprenticeship, whether that's around skill levels or work experience or overly rigid expectations around seat time within seat curricula or even discrimination. And that lunch will be followed by another series of discussions broken out by population group, again, where all of you will get a chance to share with each other the work that you are doing uh, and how it is that we can be working together to overcome some of those barriers collectively. And then finally, our third theme, how can government be a more effective partner in dealing with these first two challenges of industry engagement and apprentice diversity? Tomorrow we're going to be hearing from some exciting leaders in state government, from a governor to state legislators to state administrators who have been pushing the envelopes on these issues in their states. And we're going to talk to representatives from the key federal agencies who have already been working on these issues here at the national level, including the departments of labor, education, commerce, health and human services, agriculture, and transportation. And if that weren't enough, we have over a dozen of other panel presentations that are going to be interspersed over the next couple days on specific issues that we felt warranted some additional attention. So it's going to be a packed couple of days. And it's going to be a packed room. As you can see, we are at capacity. As a matter of fact, uh, this has been quite a hot ticket to, to get to this event, so congratulations for getting in the door. There's a lot of folks who wanted to be here who couldn't be here with you, so we're glad that you were able to join us. Uh, and we just ask for you, uh, your patience as we're going to be moving around uh, within this area over the next two days, doing a lot of discussing with each other. And please take advantage of the fact that you're in a room of such great people who are doing such incredible work in this field. Um, why so many folks are here, certainly it's the power of the issue itself, but I think it's also owes to the networks and the reputation and expertise of the national organizations who have been these conference sponsors along with National Skills Coalition in New America who have worked together to uh, make this conference possible. And so I want to recognize them now. They're in your program, but let me call them out. Uh, they include Advanced CTE, the AFL-CIO's Working for America Institute, Jobs for the Future, the National Association of Workforce Boards, the National Fund for Workforce Solutions, the National Governors Association, and the Urban Institute. Let's give all of those organizations a big hand for the work they've done here. And I also want to acknowledge the two federal agencies with whom we've been coordinating uh, a lot of the content for this conference. They've been incredible partners as well. First, the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, and particularly the U.S. DOL Office of Apprenticeship. And for them, absolutely. And the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. Let's give them some acknowledgement as well. And finally, a tremendous debt of gratitude is owed to the five national foundations who not only conceived of this event last year, but who have invested their resources to make it possible for all of us to be here over the next two days. And to give formal recognition of those funding partners and to introduce our conference's opening keynote speaker, I'd like to turn the podium over to Sarah Steinberg, who's Vice President of Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Great, thank you, Andy. Good morning, everyone. 
So starting about four years ago, J.P. Morgan Chase launched the first of what has become a $325 million investment in strengthening workforce systems and career-focused education. And the reason that we, as a, as a big bank, decided to m invest in skills was really because of two things that we were seeing in the communities that we serve. And the first was that while the economy was improving, we were still seeing among certain populations high levels of disconnection from the labor market and unemployment, especially among young people and particularly among young people of color. And then at the same time, we were also hearing from many of the businesses that we serve that they were struggling to hire workers with often the specific technical skills that they needed in order to grow their businesses and compete. And so when we made this investment, it was really um, with the aim of building an education and training system that is more closely aligned with labor market demand. And, and the idea being that if you can do that, you can create economic opportunity for individuals by connecting them to good jobs, and you can also strengthen the economy as a whole by ensuring that our workforce is really prepared for jobs in our modern economy. And we believe that apprenticeship is a really crucial part of that alignment. So an apprentice is able to get paid training in what is sort of by definition an in-demand field, while an employer is able to build a pipeline of skilled workers. Fortunately, as you can see from the uh, packed room today, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is not alone in believing in the promise of apprenticeship. And in particular, I want to thank the other four funders that are co-sponsoring this conference today. The Siemens Foundation, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, and the JPB Foundation. Thank you for your support of this conference and for all that you're doing to advance apprenticeship. The beauty and also the challenge of apprenticeship is that it really is the quintessential public-private partnership. And that means that its success depends on cooperation between educators, training providers, the public workforce system, and crucially, employers. And employers have a role to play not just in offering apprenticeship slots, that's part of it, um, but employers also have a role to play in defining in-demand occupations and skill sets, in informing credentials and curricula that are aligned with what they need in their workforce, um, and also building strong apprenticeship systems that serve the dual purpose of serving the public good, but also benefiting their bottom line. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be able to introduce today our keynote speaker, an industry leader who has really done tremendous work in all of those areas, but in particular that last one, which is developing an apprenticeship ecosystem. Noel Ginsberg founded Intertech Plastics in 1980, while he was still a student at the University of Denver. And in the years since then, it has grown into the largest custom injection molding manufacturer in the state, with more than 200 employees. But Noel is not just a business entrepreneur, and last year he founded CareerWise Colorado, an innovative new statewide apprenticeship system that connects high school students to employers, putting young people on the path to good jobs and strengthening Colorado's economy. So I want to ask you to please join me in welcoming Noel Ginsberg. <laughs> 